Hey, this is Warren Redlick. We're obviously in a challenging time today with COVID-19, a lot of different countries having a lot of different problems. I want to talk about one particular issue that I think a lot of the conversation is missing. There's a big issue with data about how we're handling data, how we understand data. We're seeing many different issues there. But I want to focus on one particular thing, one particular thing that I think everyone's missing and it's called Bayesian inference. There's a, a mathematician named Bayes, B-A-Y-E-S, and it's something I learned about when I was in college or graduate school, and I, look at, I see it as highly relevant to what we're seeing today, and I'm gonna explain it. This is something that has some mathematics in it. It has uh, fractions, it has percents. There's no algebra, there's no calculus, there's no trigonometry, so there's a small amount of math in it, it's pretty simple. I'm going to do my best to make it simple, and I hope you like it. I not like it. I hope you appreciate why this challenge makes everything more difficult for not just this particular epidemic, but any epidemic. There's a bunch of data problems we're seeing. The one that I'm most focused on is something called false positives. I'm going to talk about that a lot in this video. There's a few other problems that we're seeing. We are seeing inconsistent reporting by geography. One country reports its data one way, another country reports its data another way. Even among states in the United States, we're seeing different states reporting things in different ways. Maybe the biggest example of this is in Italy, where any death where someone had COVID-19 is reported as a death from COVID-19, where a substantial number of the people are dying or people who would have died anyway, and the cause of death was not COVID-19. We don't know how much that problem is happening in different places because there's just inconsistent reporting. So that's a big issue. That covers both the inconsistent reporting. Some places are testing more, some places are seeing more, some places have a pocket where there's a lot of activity. I think the biggest example of this is the death rate on the Diamond Princess was much lower than what people are saying for the virus elsewhere. There's not a lot of good explanations for this. Japan is not seeing the explosion of problems that was predicted for it. Why? These are all potentially data-related problems. The biggest problem that I see that no one's talking about is the Bayesian inference problem. So let's talk about Bayes. The Bayesian inference problem starts with the false positive rate. We don't know what the false positive rate is for the tests that are being used. A false positive rate is if you test 100 people for anything, whether it's a virus, bacterial infection, could be something completely different. If 1% of the people who don't have it test positive anyway, the test has, to be clear, the tests, any test has some level of inaccuracy. And it's very hard to know what, but just a simple example, if there's a test of 100 people who don't have it, and you have a 1% false positive rate, then one of those 100 people will test positive even though they don't have it. There's also a false negative problem that I'm not gonna talk about today because I don't think that's a significant issue with COVID-19. The false negative problem is you test 100 people, let's suppose you have a 1% false negative rate. You test 100 people who do have it, one of them will test negative even though they do have it. So we don't know the false positive rate for these tests and there may be more than one or two different, I think there are multiple kinds of tests so we don't know what the false positive rates are for any of these tests. I've seen false positive rates in other I've read journal articles talking about different kinds of testing, and in particular, this is some form of PCR testing. I've seen some examples where the test, uh, the false positive rate can be as high as 17%. 3%, 5%, 17%. I've seen all kinds of numbers. We don't really know the false positive rate for any of the tests that are being done. It's, it, somebody might know, but we don't know. I'm going to use 1% as a false positive rate in this video. I actually think the false positive rate is probably higher than that, but I'm going to go with 1% because that's a, a reasonable number to use when you look at false positive rates in general. Keep in mind that if the false positive rate is higher, the Bayesian problem I'm going to describe gets worse. So let's start with some basics. The population of the United States is 330 million people. Let's talk about the early days of any epidemic. Let's suppose we're at an early stage in the United States, before today, let's say. Um, let's say it's January, who knows when, somewhere early on in the spread of the virus. 
and only 3,300 people have it. I'm choosing the number 3,300 because that is one in 100,000 people. And using simple numbers with, uh, that are multiples of 10 makes it easier to work with. So let's suppose one in 100,000 people have the virus in the early days of the virus. And again, we have a false, we're assuming a false positive rate of 1%. So that one in 100,000 means 0.001% of the population actually has the virus. One of the things I've seen people talking about is that we need to do random sampling, test random people in the population to, to see where the virus is and to see how it's spread. This is terribly misguided when you think about the Bayesian problem. Why? Well, if you test 100,000 people at random, when only one in 100,000 people have it, and the false positive rate is 1%, then 1,000 people will test positive, 1,001 maybe. Roughly, you know, there's gonna be some variation, but it's gonna be approximately 1,000 people test positive, and only one of those 1,000 people will have it because the only one in 100,000 people have it at this point, and you've tested people at random. So if someone tests positive in that scenario, it means there's a 99.9% .9 chance they don't have the virus. That means you're gonna overestimate the number of people who have the virus because you're going by a false positive. You're actually measuring the false positive rate instead of measuring the number of people who have the virus. Now let's suppose you get targeted. You say, you know what, we're not gonna test everybody. We're gonna test the 10% of the population that's most likely to have the virus. We're gonna look at symptoms. We're gonna look at who's been exposed, who's traveled. We're gonna try to narrow it down and we're only gonna test 10% of the population. Well, you test 10,000 people then, instead of 100,000 people. And when you test those 10,000 people, 100 are gonna test positive. Now, assuming you did a good job and you got the correct most likely people to have it, one person who tests positive actually has it. And a positive test result means a 99% chance you don't have the virus. This is still very unsettling. This really is not helpful. If you get a test that says you're positive and there's only a one in 100 chance you have it, that's really not a very helpful test. That means 100 people will go through further treatment, testing, isolation that don't need it. 99 out of 100 or 100 out of 101 people will go through all sorts of hoops unnecessarily. The prevalence of the disease will be vastly overreported. Now let's suppose the disease has advanced, the virus has spread more. And now there's 33,000 people who have it instead of 3,300 people. So the disease has progressed a week, a month, however long. And now a lot more people have it. So you get to 33,000. That's still one in 10,000 people or 0.01% of the population that actually has the virus. And you do a random sample. You have essentially the same problem you had before. It's a little better, but it's still a huge problem. So you test 10,000 people. Remember, only one in 10,000 people have it, but you have a false positive rate of 1%. 100 people will test positive, or 101 people on average will test positive, and only one of them will have it. So a positive test result means a 99% chance you don't have it. Same problem, a little different. You're at this stage with the 33,000 people actually have it, one in 10,000 people have it, and you do the same narrowing again. You only test the 10% most likely to have it. People who have symptoms, people who've traveled, people who've had contact with others who you think have had it. So you're narrowing it down to 10%. So you're testing 1,000 people. Well, you have a 1% false positive rate, so 10 people are gonna test positive. Maybe 11 if you got the right group and you got the one who's actually positive. So 10 out of 11 people who test positive don't have it. 91% chance you don't have it if you test positive. This is still very unsatisfactory. This is the Bayesian problem. I didn't even get into the fact that there's an asymptomatic population. There are people who have the virus but have no symptoms. This is a huge issue the, among young people. People on, under the age of 20 and really under the age of 30, the vast majority, people under the age of 20 generally are not symptomatic. They have no symptoms. So maybe 90 plus percent of people under 20 who have the virus don't show it. Even under 40, there's a large percentage of the people. Rand Paul, Senator Rand Paul was diagnosed uh, was te he tested positive for the virus, but he has no symptoms. So does he have it or does he not have it? We don't really know how specific, are, how, what's the specificity of the testing? Are there follow-up tests they can do that can make it more likely they know? Huge issue. There's another side to that. When I said you test the 10% of the people who are most likely to have it, if half the people who have it are asymptomatic, it's hard to narrow down to the 10% of the people who are most likely to have it if you have to include people who are asymptomatic because 
most of the population doesn't have it and they're asymptomatic because they don't have it. And, you know, keep in mind there are people who are symptomatic because they have the flu, because they have a cold, there's other symptoms. So it's very hard to narrow down to that 10%. This asymptomatic population just adds more problems to this whole Bayesian inference problem. This feeds into another issue with Bayesian inference, which is circularity. Keep in mind, we don't really know how many people have it in the first place. And now you do this testing, and let's say you, do, you test and you, and you get 1,000 false positives for every positive, for every genuine positive. And then you report back, geez, look at all these people who have it. Well, those are, those are people who are testing positive. It's very, there's a circularity. You can't know how many people have it. If you test, you can't know how accurate your test is because of the Bayesian inference problem. And so that feeds back into you still don't know how many people have it. You might exaggerate the number of people ha who have it, which then exaggerates the confidence you have in your test results. There's this huge problem of circularity that this goes back upon itself and you can't really know. Ultimately, in a genuine epidemic, the virus will really spread and a large percentage of the population will have it. Once you get to 10% of the population having it or 30, 40, 50% of the population having it, the Bayesian problem basically goes away. It's still there, but it becomes relatively unimportant. It only matters when a very small percentage of the population has it. Even 1% of the population having it, the Bayesian problem is real. But certainly when you have 1 in 10,000 have it, 1 in 100,000 have it, it's a huge problem. Yeah, the Bayesian problem goes away. Unfortunately, the Bayesian problem goes away when you have a really huge problem with the virus. I'd like to tell you there's some great answer to this Bayesian problem. There isn't. You can get better false positive rates on your testing. That helps. But 1% is pretty darn good. Um, really, it's just one of those things where we, there's things we can't know and we do the best we can with what we have. It is a huge, challenging problem that we just don't have good answers to. So I know this is kind of grim. I remain very optimistic that we will get through this, that yes, this is a problem. Yes, there are people who are going to die who shouldn't die. Uh, our hospitals are going to have crowding problems. We're going to have really real issues with this. I do think this is going to be worse than the ordinary flu. I don't know. I think it's probably going to be worse than the ordinary flu. Is it going to be worse than tuberculosis? Probably not. But I'm optimistic that we will get through the virus. I'm concerned about how we're shutting down our economy to deal with it. I personally don't think that's the right approach, but regardless, I think we are, humans are resilient. Our society is resilient. We will find a way to get through this. Um, I'm worried that the economic approach that we're taking is going to kill more people than the virus through suicides, through starvation, through isolation causing problems. I, I still remain optimistic we will get through this. It may take weeks, months, uh, hopefully not more than a few months, and we're going to get on with our lives and life is going to get better in so many ways. So I know this is a tough time, but try to stay positive. Look on the bright side of life. I don't want to go all money python on you, but always look on the bright side of life. We're going to get through this. We're going to get better. Thank you for watching.